Today on BRS TV, we're talking LPS corals. Hey guys, my name is Ryan. Welcome to another week of the BRS 160, where every week we do our best to help you guys, members of the reefing community, enjoy your tanks and find new ways to explore the hobby. We do that by following the setup and progression of this 160 gallon reef tank. Last week we explored the world of soft corals, this week we're diving into LPS corals, starting with what makes them different than other corals, some info on where the corals come from, typical care standards, as well as some details on specific corals like placement, growth, flow, lighting, and nutritional requirements. The primary difference between the soft corals we showed last week and LPS corals is LPS corals have a stony skeletal base made primarily of calcium carbonate with large fleshy polyps, or in some cases one giant polyp or sheets of large polyps which can be hard to discern from each other. That said, LPS is a hobby term, not a scientific term, so it can really mean anything that hobbyists collectively apply to it. There are branching types like most of the Euphilias and Duncans, encrusting corals like Favias, plating chalices, and a bunch of corals that in the reef tank are more standalone corals like Goniopora, Galaxia, Trachephilia, Scalemia, and Fungia. Because many of the LPS corals are fairly large, LPS tanks are probably the easiest way to almost instantly create a reef tank full of intense color and movement, and probably what I'd recommend to your average reefer who wants to set up up a tank that's amazing in a fairly short period of time. Before we dive into each coral, I'd like to spend a moment talking about the basics behind where we get the corals from and how different collection practices impact your tank. Last week we shared with you right behind the local fish store, the BRS team trusts online shops like Unique Corals, Austin Aqua Farms, and Worldwide Corals, but we'd like to go one layer beyond that and share some expectation in relation to wild collected corals, maricultured corals, and aquacultured corals. Wild collected corals are about as simple as it sounds. Corals collected from the ocean's reefs. Main benefits are these corals tend to be significantly larger than other options and lower cost as well, which is a pretty attractive combo. I won't fault anyone for buying wild because almost all of us own wild corals in our tanks, but on a long enough timeline, there's some pretty obvious concerns about the sustainability of wild collection and why there's a robust industry growing around other options. Mariculture is a process of seeding small coral frags and growing them out in their natural habitat. There's a whole slew of benefits associated with this, starting with it's absolutely the greenest option. The carbon footprint of using the sun and ocean to grow something is almost non-existent. Beyond that, the colonies are larger than the frags you get from aquaculture. Most of them have selected species and strains known for awesome color and high survivability rates, which is great for the businesses and the end game reefer who buys them. Mariculture corals are also a sustainable option to progress the hobby into an arena that has minimal impact in the world's natural reefs. Mariculture also provides sustainable jobs in countries that not only need them, but also provides a healthy alternative to the local people than less lucrative and more reef damaging practices. All in all, in many cases provides more healthy and colorful corals. They're fairly low cost and good for both the reefs and the people of the world. Easy win if you have the option. In fact, a lot of the local and online shops are starting to really promote which corals are maricultured because reefers want them. Beyond that is aquaculture. Aquaculture almost certainly means you're going to get a tiny frag of a coral. It's probably going to cost a lot, but there are a lot of benefits here that shouldn't be overlooked. These tiny frags were selected because they represent the best of the best in our industry. Depending on the coral, that can be amazing color, growth patterns, health, or any number of things. If you don't mind waiting to grow them out, which to be honest is half the fun of this hobby, the best reason to go aquaculture is because the corals have been grown under artificial lights and already accustomed to aquarium conditions, which means they're going to keep that awesome color and drastically increase the overall survivability rates. Not only that, but they've only had to endure a tiny fraction of the handling and transport. A wild or maricultured coral is collected from the ocean, brought to a holding facility, frequently flown halfway around the world to LA, placed in storage facilities, sold to local distributor or stores, and flown there and so on. This is a lot of handling. Aquaculture facilities like ORA ship direct from the grow out facilities to local fish stores, which is a tiny fraction of that transport. However, in recent years, some of the better online shops are starting to specialize in aquaculture and ship direct to you. Worldwide corals, for example, sent us almost exclusively aquaculture corals. You can see the ridiculous coloration these corals have, and while we're going to have to wait for them to grow out, it will be worth it. So what are the requirements for maintaining an LPS tank? 
keeping in mind that LPS is an all-encompassing non-scientific term, for the most part, they like low to average lighting, moderate variable flow, they're less sensitive to water quality, and enjoy a nutrient-rich environment. I'd like to explain what each of these means in a bit more detail, starting with what is low to moderate lighting? That means something different to everyone out there, and even here at BRS, the way we talk about it evolves over time. Since most of you don't own a PAR meter to measure light intensity, I'll start with saying that low intensity probably means a handful of T5 bulbs, a smaller or low cost LED turned down to about 50 to 70 percent, and the most powerful modules turned down to 30 or 40 percent. If you happen to own a PAR meter, the BRS team feels that low light corals generally refers to about 50 to 100 PAR, moderate light corals between 100 and 200, high PAR over 200, and very high PAR over 300. So depending on the species, a range of 50 to 200 is a pretty fair assumption for most LPS corals, and right in the middle, just over 100, is probably close to the sweet spot where most corals will either thrive or tolerate. There's a lot of opinion to all this, and some reefers might think that the high and very high PAR ranges should be higher because they have a coral sitting right under the light source at four to 500 PAR, but six inches to the right or left of that coral is an almost identical species thriving at two to 300 PAR. So we're not talking about peak par at its highest point. We're talking about a range that the corals will thrive in and somewhat of an average par within the area you plan on putting the corals in. Par meters used to be somewhat of a luxury item and not a whole lot of value because we were all using the same T5 and halide bulbs with reflectors which offered pretty dispersed lighting. With LEDs, they've given us the keys to spectrum, intensity, and often more intense and less diffused light. A par meter has become a pretty valuable tool at this point. None of them are cheap, but I think at 199 bucks a Senai might be the lowest cost option. And I found autocorrects for the blue spectrums found in aquariums pretty well. Probably the most important component to remember with lighting LPS is more is not better. You're a hundred times more likely to kill a coral with too much light than not enough. If the coral is shrinking up, polyps are coming out the skeletal structure, oozing out zooxanthellae or other signs of stress, there's a really good chance it's because the light is too strong. Try moving it to a darker area of the tank or turning the lights down. One thing I'll note as far as LPS lighting goes, I've personally seen an enormous amount of Kessel lit LPS tanks which seem to thrive in almost any setting. There's something about the spectrum or spread which makes it both hard to mess up and easy to adjust. In terms of flow, I think about as much as it can visibly handle. Good flow has a whole variety of benefits, but the tissue should just be swaying in the flow, not forcefully getting blasted. LPS tanks all benefit quite a bit from the varied flow that comes from simple on-off wave makers or more advanced DC controllable pumps that make sure the corals are not getting blasted in the exact same way 24 hours a day. In terms of water quality, LPS does seem to tolerate lower quality water better than higher demand corals like SPS. One thing I'd like to note is there is a difference between tolerate and thrive, grow, and show their best color. I'd also note that many reefers believe that the word tolerate just means dies slower. So this isn't a license to maintain a dirty tank with a poor maintenance schedule. It just means you don't have to be as strict as you do with more demanding species. Most reefers do, however, agree that LPS corals thrive, reproduce, and show their best color in high nutrient environments. One common misconception I'd like to keep reminding reefers is high nutrients doesn't mean high nitrate and high phosphate. While they are nutrients themselves, they're really the end result of the breakdown process of nutrients, which the LPS corals are more likely to utilize. Many LPS corals can capture fairly large meaty prey like mysis shrimp. In general, I say the smaller the better because smaller foods are easier to break down. Smaller particulate foods like reef chili are accepted as well. Fish foods and resulting waste adds all kinds of vitamins, amino acids, and carbohydrates to the water column. There are a ton of additives on the market as well. On the BRS 160, we'll be using KZ's LPS amino acid concentrate as well as coral vitalizer and reef chili. It's important to note that higher coral nutrients with all these foods and additives will also likely have a net result of higher nitrate and phosphate related nutrients as well. Make sure that your nutrient export methods with skimmers, refugiums, nitrate reactors, carbon dosing, or general maintenance with water changes keeps phosphate and nitrate levels in check, or your new LPS tank is going to run into algae or other nitrate and phosphate related issues like slower calcification and health issues. Beyond all that, because LPS corals do have a stony base, they pull calcium and alkalinity from the surrounding water, and you do have to replace it if you want to keep the corals healthy and growing. We've already spent weeks discussing the different methods of maintaining calcium and alkalinity, so please check them out if you need a refresher. Week 29 through 32, for everything you could ever want to know about the science behind maintaining these elements, two-part Kelkwasser and calcium reactors. 
One of the more popular LPS corals are the euphilias with hammers, torches, and frog spawn. They all have very distinctly shaped polyps. Torches have a long tubular shaped tentacle. Frog spawn tentacles have a more regular shape with random color nodules. Hammers tentacles have a very distinct anchor shaped end. Most of these can be found in wall form as well as branching. The walls are typically one large long polyp that occasionally splits where the branching types have more distinct branching heads. In general, most reefers would say that branching types are a bit easier to care for, particularly if something goes wrong. It's common for the entire wall head to die altogether. Whereas with the branching types, it's more likely that the infection or issue is isolated to a single head and it stops there. As far as Euphilia's care is concerned, each coral is always unique, but I've seen them in basically every common light intensity there is, T5s, halides, all types of LEDs. As with anything, start low and work your way up if needed. They'll let you know when they're receiving too much light. Same thing with water flow, and while you should take care of your tank, they do seem to tolerate lower quality water better than many corals. Worldwide sent us two nice torch frags with an orange with blue tips as well as a green with purple tips. These are single heads of what will ultimately grow into a much larger coral, but starting with some pretty cool coloration, Unique also sent a similar torch frag with a bit thicker tentacles. Unique also sent a couple mariculture euphilias with a wall hammer and a branching frog spawn. Mariculture corals are pretty easy to identify because most have a large artificial base they're grown on. They also do some cool things to make them more saleable. For instance, on this frog spawn, they placed a handful of the branching heads at different places on the mount. This is going to allow the coral to grow much faster into a large colony and have a nice uniform shape. Euphilias can grow pretty fast once they get settled in. In the right environment, a head or two can easily grow into a half dozen in a year or so, and the growth is somewhat exponential from there. To round the affiliates out, we also have the toxic green hammer Austin Aqua Farms provided. Typically when corals are listed as toxic green, they have an ultra neon color and this is it. They also provided a really nice wall frog spawn, which is going to be really cool to see grow out. Next up is Galaxia. Galaxia is one of the cooler corals you can add to the tank, however it has one big issue related to the sweepers. It can send them out over several inches in many cases and it packs a powerful sting to other corals, meaning placement is going to be a pretty important component. Really needs to be pretty far away from other corals, especially expensive ones. Unique Coral's green galaxy is stunning. Reefers often say galaxy looks like a bursting star, and this one doesn't disappoint. Nor does the worldwide's WWC blue and orange galaxia. Galaxia isn't a particularly fast grower in most cases, so a small frag like this might be an awesome way for many reefers to add it to their collection while managing the sweeper issue a bit. Care is similar to other LPS, moderate light, decent flow without directly blasting it. And while you don't have to feed them in most cases, they do likely do better with periodic feedings of smaller particulate foods like reef chili or dissolved nutrients like amino acids. Generally, they're considered pretty hardy corals and most reefers won't have a lot of trouble keeping them happy. Next up is a controversial elegance coral. We have two awesome examples here with the Aussie elegance coral from Austin Aqua Farms and the purple tip elegance coral from Unique Corals. Elegance corals are large, highly fluorescent corals with awesome colored tentacles, which basically anyone would want in their tank. So where's the controversy? Well, they have a pretty bad rap for low survivability in the hobby. I've heard a lot of theories, most based on collection location and methods, but the most popular theory is Australian elegance corals have higher survivability rates. To be honest, this is about a hit or miss as any other hard to keep coral in our hobby and probably gets slightly worse rap than it really deserves. I'd say more people are unsuccessful than successful, but there are also reefers who own three and never had an issue. A lot of reefers will say that elegance corals are likely one of those corals that are best left in the ocean. They might be right, but that's been said about almost every coral in our hobby. If you do elect to buy one, do some research first and share your findings with the community. I think there's a good chance we'll leave these two in the BRS-160 and we'll keep you updated as to how they do. Our approach was number one, get them from a reputable supplier like Austin and Unique. Well, this is far from making survival a sure thing, buying your livestock from suppliers you trust to be doing this the best in the industry and work with the best importers with the least amount of handling will always be a huge component of success, particularly with corals that you know full well have survivability issues to begin with. Beyond that, we'll find a lower flow area of the tank with space for it to expand and not bother other corals with moderate light. The BRS-160 is running Zeo, so it'll be low in nitrate and phosphate, but we'll be dosing a considerable amount of nutrients with KZ LPS amino, coral vitalizer, and reef chili, which are potentially nutrients a coral like this is more likely to benefit from. With a bit of luck, we'll find some success and we'll share how it goes as the tank progresses. I think one of the coolest corals we picked up for this episode is Unique Coral's Ultra Australian Hydnophora. This is one of the 
brightest corals I've come across and just stunning in person. Hydnophora comes in all kinds of growth patterns, some fairly similar to branching SPS corals and others closer to plating or encrusting types like this one. You can debate all day about hydrophora. Is it SPS or LPS? But remember, that's not a scientific term, just a hobby-based term for general grouping. The branching types look a bit closer to SPS, but I'd say this type is closer to LPS coral. Hydnophora is a moderate to highlight coral in most cases. It can be placed in higher locations in the tank if you like. One thing to keep in mind is they have one of the most damaging stings in the tank, so make sure to absolutely keep it away from other corals in the tank. I'd also put it in a higher flow area of the tank. It's likely to appreciate smaller particulate foods like reef chili. One of the most stunning and desirable LPS corals these days are Scalemia. Scalemias have some of the best coloration of any corals in the hobby. The best ones, of course, come at a pretty serious price point. Austin sent us this awesome solid orange version, but they come in almost every color under the sun, as well as rainbows of color all in the same coral. This LPS coral is basically one large single polyp that almost always placed in the sand, and no surprise, moderate lighting flow and water quality. This might be unique to my experience, but I've seen Scalemia survive in almost every environment, including tanks I'd call pretty poorly maintained. So it's hard to beat a coral that looks this stunning and requires almost nothing special to take care of it. Worldwide provided us with a few examples of another popular coral with a few goniopora frags, the WWC Cherry Red, WWC Crimson Red Micro Goniopora, and the WWC Fruit Loops Micro Goniopora. There are two different types here with the more standard goniopora and micro. Micro has much smaller arms but amazing color. The standard types have really long arms which flow in the water column. There are very few LPS corals like this which have this kind of awesome tentacle color shape and movement. I will say that most reefers will have a lot of success with this coral because like most LPS the demands are minimal but the 12 month success rates are probably a bit lower than many other LPS corals. I think there's two ways you can get beyond that point. Let's start with a strain that you know does well with artificial lighting in the reef tank environment. Meaning aquacultured frags like this are probably your best bet, not only for best long-term success rates, but also the best color. They also likely benefit many of the nutrients or small particle foods we've been discussing today. We can't talk about LPS corals without talking about the ever-popular Acan estria lord huensis, or Acan lords for short. There's been some recent science that points to the correct classification really being Micromusa, but since the hobby is still collectively calling them Acan lords, and that's what they're sold as, that's what we're going to stick to for this episode. Acan lords form large colonies of quarter or so sized polyps which encrust the surface of whatever they're placed on. Similar to zoanth as we covered last week, acan lords come in a vast array of colorations and because of that they're also one of the most commonly collected corals. Many reefers are filling most of their tank with a whole variety of different color acan lords. They typically have an exponential growth component where one polyp can grow into two, two into four, and so on until they end up like these huge colonies that Austin Aqua Farm sent us with a multicolor acan lord colony, another cool example, and a super rainbow acan lord. This is where Charlie always picks up his acan lords and something that Austin specializes in. If you're interested in seeing some really cool examples, check out their site. Acan lords absolutely do best in high nutrient environments, moderate to higher par ranges and good flow. They also actively take on meaty foods like mysis shrimp. This is one of the few corals where I'd personally take the time to hand feed them small mysis because it will absolutely result in larger, healthier polyp structure and increased growth rates. Somewhat similar to these corals is the Acan estria echinata. Unique coral sent us an awesome frag where you can tell they have the potential to show some of the same awesome color but a slightly different polyp structure. Rather than the very distinct set of separate polyps, Acan estria echinata polyps look more like a single sheet of polyps that appear to share a wall. Care standards are about the same and the polyps will encrust the rock or structure the corals placed on in a similar fashion. Another super popular pair of encrusting corals are the Favia and Favites. Without looking at the skeletal structure, it's hard to know for sure which is which, and it's probably confused more often than we think. The difference being the Favites coralites share walls, where the Favias have a honeycomb of conical coralites with their own unique walls. We have three favias here, starting with this large dragon soul favia from Unique Corals. If you look closely, you can see the divisions between the coralites and why it's identified as a favia. If you look closely at the Ozzy Favites Pentagona, the war coral that Austin provided, you can see each of the coralites share a wall and why we call it a Favites. Again, without looking at the actual skeletal structure, it's impossible to know for sure. And other than just knowing for fun or collection purposes, it doesn't really matter much because they have the same easy care requirements. 
Worldwide since it's a handful of the most colorful aquaculture options, so you can get ideas of some of the more rare colors. It'd be pretty rare from a wild coral with the WWC Space Monkey Favia, WWC Hollyberries Favites, WWC Lemon Lime Favites, and the WWC Radioactive Favites, all of which are pretty awesome, and I look forward to seeing them grow out. Again, both Favites and Favio will encrust the rock they're attached to and have the same moderate care standards other LPS corals we've been discussing today have. Some of them can probably tolerate the more intense range of lighting that LPS can tolerate. It's important to note that Favios will also send out sweepers at night which can bother other corals, so consider that when you're deciding where to place them. There are a handful of really cool encrusting corals that are from the same family as Favias and Favites with Goniastria, Leptistria, and Cyphistria. Unique provided an awesome example of all three, starting with the Australian toxic green Goniastria and the purple people eater Cyphastria. Both of these examples generally have closed polyps during the day. Unique provided two really cool examples of Leptistria with orange Leptistria and a blue eyed. These are a bit different because the polyps are generally out during the day, which most reefers will appreciate. All of these come in different species, collected from different areas and depths, so it's hard to give direct care advice other than I'd start at the low end of the LPS lighting intensity ranges and work your way up if needed. Worldwide sent a couple other encrusting corals from the Pavona family with the Golden Pavona Frag and the WWC Toxic Waste Leptoceris. Pavonas come in a variety of species which encrust the surface of the rock in different ways. The most popular probably being referred to as the cactus, potato chip, or lettuce coral. I'm not exactly sure which type this golden pavona is. Really hard to tell until they get a bit larger. Same with the toxic waste Leptoceris. It appears to be more of an encrusting type, but we'll see as it grows out. The last two encrusting corals we're going to cover today is the Stylocinellia and the Lithophilon with the vivid Stylocinellia and the WWC Sunkissed Lithophilon. There's just a lot of encrusting corals out there and all of them are awesome. One thing I'd like to note about the Lithophilon is it's typically found on the lower slopes of reefs, so wild species are likely to do better in lower light. The WWC Sunkissed Lithophilon was aquacultured, so it's likely accustomed to moderate artificial light. Interestingly enough, the Lithophilon is actually in the same family of corals as the Fungia. Fungias are kind of cool because they're one of the free living corals which actually have the ability to move themselves around to some degree. If they get buried, they can inflate themselves and free themselves of sand. In the reef aquarium, this disc type, like this super bright orange from Austin Aqua or the green from Unique are almost always placed in the sand. I'd say they generally do better in lower flow areas of the tank where they're unlikely to get constantly covered in sand and they do well with moderate lighting. Next up are the chalices. These are always super popular LPS corals with a couple of the more popular being the Echinophilia and Mycetium. Chalices are typically large circular oval corals that grow outward. Many of the Echinophilias tend to be smoother where the Mycetiums have a much more regular surface. This Mycetium colony from Austin is one of my personal favorite pieces in the tank, but you can tell when the Fox Roger Rampage Mycetium grows out from worldwide, it's going to be awesome as well. We have a few examples of the Echinophilias with the WWC Oblivion Chalice, the Mariculture Echinophilia from Unique, as well as a Purple Echinophilia and a White Eye Frag, both also from Unique. Most chalices will do well in the low to mid range of the tank. Keep in mind that they'll shade anything below it as it grows out, so do a bit of planning before you select its home. Next up, we have a couple of branching corals, starting with Duncan Opsamia, or more commonly referred to as Duncans. They're in the same family as sun corals. However, Duncans are photosynthetic, so they're much easier to take care of. This is an example of a Duncan colony from Austin. Notice their cool polyps are typically out during the day, which is likely one of the reasons why Duncans are so popular. I have seen them shy away from more intense lighting as well as really high flow. If their polyps are closed, it generally means that they don't like something about their environment, so try adjusting the flow or light or move the coral to a more appropriate area. Colostria, more commonly referred to as candy cane or trumpet coral, is a fairly similar example of a branching coral with large fleshy polyps at the end. Unique provided this example of Colostria. Notice the polyps are often closed during the day unless they sense the presence of food, in which case they can sometimes open. Colastria tends to do better in low light to begin with, but I've seen it acclimated to all but the most intense light with time. Another super popular LPS coral is the Blastomusa, or Blasto for short. This is a polyp of the Boogie Nights Blasto from Worldwide. Blastos are one of my personal favorite corals. I'd say this is another one of those pretty hardy corals that if they get settled in correctly, they'll be fairly easy to take care of forever. It's generally thought that Blastos do much better when they're in very low light and flow areas of the tank. This aquacultured version from Worldwide is likely less finicky than a wild-collected Blasto. 
Most reefers have the best success actually putting them in a shaded area of the tank and progressively moving them out into a low light area of the tank. They'll often take meaty foods and likely benefit from dissolved nutrients like amino acids. The last three corals of the day are commonly referred to as types of brain corals with lobophilia, trachephilia, and symphilia. Unique corals sent to maricultured red lobophilia. I'd characterize lobophilia as a fairly slow growing but attractive coral. Wild collected versions will typically have a half dozen or so heads. Trachephilia are typically placed in the sand and the jumbo sized polyp generally completely covers the entire skeletal base. This is a nice one that Unique sent us. They come in all kinds of colors and shape variations. They're also not particularly expensive, so they can be a great way to fill in some of the sand and bring some color to the tank. Symphilia is also one of the more hardy species of brain coral, also most frequently kept in the sand. This is an example of a maricultured red symphilia from Unique. All of the brain corals do well in lower to moderate flow and lighting and really don't require feedings to maintain their health. They are one of the coral types, however, that can adapt to a pretty extreme range of environments if they're acclimated appropriately. I'd like to give a big thanks again to Worldwide Corals, Unique Corals, and Austin Aquafarms for being so kind in providing all these corals so you can get a good look at them. If you get a chance, check out their websites because they really do represent some of the best in the industry. While you're at it, let them know the team at BRS sent you. Last week we asked all of you, where do you shop for your corals? And not surprisingly, three-fourths of you shop at the local fish store, which is great. A robust system of fish stores is awesome for the hobby. This week we're asking you, if you could only have one type of LPS coral in the tank, what would it be? So hit that I in the upper right hand corner and vote. Then if you made it this far, give us some support with a quick thumbs up and subscribe. We'll see you next week with week 37, SPS Corals.